Joe, you want to pick that up? Yeah. Well, it's, it's all about economics. You know, um, as I listened to Andrew talk uh, and Marjorie a moment ago, I was thinking, you know, it's all about economics. And um, at some point, we will need new facilities. I think we're a long way from that point because uh, today there's existing capacity in the current facilities and um, companies like the one that Jim Devine um, operates and the one that I came from have ideas on how they can substantially increase their throughputs without expanding their footprints. Um, but at some point, we will have to use the properties that have been land banked like um, Motby and other properties uh, to develop them as working waterfront because it's all about jobs, it's all about the well-being of the region and, um, yeah, you know, sometimes looking back at history you know, is, is, is maybe not the thing we should be doing. We should be looking ahead. But, again, all that we have here came about because of this harbor and trade. And we can't lose sight of that because if we do, um, I think it will have a devastating impact not only on the city but the whole region economically. One thing that people can do if they're committed to working waterfronts is work with our state legislators and to work with, uh, with Congress to make sure that there is working waterfront legislation passed in both states and the federal government. Thank, thank you. Additional questions? Henry Malman with the San Diego Pilots. And in regard to the uh, Dread Spoil Island, and the, uh, I've pretty much been a veteran of dredging in New York Harbor for a long time. And hey, Andy, that's the first time I've ever seen you in a tie. <laughs> but uh, we, we have advocated for uh, the Dredge Spoil Islands. I've been with the pilots for 40 years, and we've been pushing the concept of Dredge Spoil Islands. And it, it has always failed because uh, there's been a fish in the way or, uh, or, or a favorite breeding ground of a snail. And uh, in fact, we've taken great uh, amounts of granite out of the Kilvan Cull as we dredged it and uh, dumped it in the ocean when we could have uh, easily used it to, uh, to encapsulate a dredged spoil island. Uh, I, I think we move a lot of ships through New York Harbor in a very safe and an efficient way. And uh, I think that sometimes environmentalists forget that uh, <clears throat> when you, you know, when you, when you move cargo by water, you know, there are all sorts of different environmentalists and they have all sorts of different aspects. Some want air pollution, some want water pollution or no water pollution. And it seems that we could all be working in the same direction if we, if we just sat down and, and, and looked at it, the big picture instead of our own little backyard. Thank you. All right, we have time for maybe one or two more qu questions. Please. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Amy Goldsmith. Um, I'm the state director of the New Jersey Environmental Federation and chair of the Coalition for Healthy Ports. And I appreciate your comments um, on the Port Authority's truck plan. But uh, the, the concerns that we have is about how to use properly use public funds, both the Port Authority and um, federal DIRA and stimulus money, to actually not have the cleanup of the trucks and the air on the backs of the drivers, which is the current plan. So we would like to see how to use public money to actually reach the investments. Like in LA, they used $44 million to get 8,000 state-of-the-art 2007 trucks. This plan here at the Port of New York and New Jersey is at best going to get um, six to 10 trucks on the road instead of the 700 goal, instead of the 7,000 trucks that really need to be cleaned up. So, and they're going to do that with much, uh, many more dollars per truck than LA. And so we'd like to see how are we going to get to use public funds in the way that isn't on the backs of individual drivers, but actually gets the result, the efficient movement of the goods, good jobs, clean environment for the communities that are most affected. I know I'm not going to try and tackle that. I'm not sure if uh, if anybody else would like to. Uh, I can understand the concern. I, I would only make a comment that 
that you got a totally different operating system between L.A. and New York in terms of what the roles and responsibilities are of the Port Authority, and I'm not going to stand here and defend the Port Authority, but we'll only say that the Port Authority has uh, many additional focuses than the Port of L.A., which is pretty much uh, uh, laser focused on maritime commerce. Our Port Authority is uh, maritime commerce is not on the on the uh, on the front burner at some times, and, uh, and they're not funded to the extent that, uh, that, and where public funds could be brought to bear, I can't c comment on it. Uh, I believe there's one more question here. Thank you. Uh, I'm John Muir. I'm on the board of the Gowanus Canal Conservancy in Brooklyn. And I was struck by m Mr. Yarrow representing as one of, part of the challenge of the future. Um, a phrase that was that's new to me, um, legacy labor costs. Now, being from Brooklyn, um, where the very air carries the stink of legacy labor costs, um, and where uh, our waterfront from the 1930s and 40s and 50s and 60s was controlled by the mob openly, and where labor unions were corrupt openly, and that's still in the air in Brooklyn. We point those people out on the streets. Can there be an end to this, is my question to the panel. Um, do these unions still have the power to shut down the harbor? They haven't done it in at least a generation to my recollection, but they used to do it regularly. Um, why do we continue these higher costs way, way, way above market and above the competition uh, and feather bed contracts with the same unions are renewed year after year after year? I'd be grateful to hear from the panel. I think I'll start with that, and I know Joe's going to want to take a piece of you as well. <laughs> um, I've been working on the waterfront in the Port of New York since 1973. I call to my attention any number of good friends that are in the International Longshoremen's Association. There is no question that historically uh, organized crime was a part of, of the waterfront. That would be a foolish move to try and deny it. There is, however, uh, clearly been and continues to be a new day. I would make the comment there's no more organized crime in the International Longshoremen's Association than there is in any other major uh, union operation in the, the greater port of New York or for that place any, anywhere in the United States. Uh, the, the Waterfront Commission did a good job initially in addressing what was historically part of, uh, part of the legacy of, of, of this harbor. I think it's a tremendous disservice that uh, the, the conception that organized crime is an integral part of the waterfront today and it's manifested in too many uh, what I consider trash movies such as The Wire or any, other, uh, any of these other shows that, uh, that glorify or continue to perpetuate organized crime. Um, other than that, I, I, can't, I could go on at some length. Um, I can tell you factually having run major terminals in New York and now running three, two, two other terminals, one in Bayonne and, and one on Staten Island. It was on a fringe aspect in the last 20 years. Today it doesn't exist in the active role. Is there something in a back room that somebody gets a job because they're related to somebody? That's possibly true, but I can tell you that I personally bring people into the industry and I'm not paid off for it. So nepotism is a part of the waterfront, always will be, it's perhaps a good Good point. We could go on. I'll gladly discuss this with you later. I'll let Joe take a piece of you if he likes to. I'll just, uh, I'll just have one yeah, I'll just uh, talk quickly, uh, John, uh, Bob. Um, Mr. Muir, I think uh, Mr. Yarrow, when he was talking about uh, legacy labor costs, he was talking about things like the New York pension. Um, we have an unusual situation here in New York, very much unlike any other port, where we had a large group of workers handling brake bulk and general cargo and that large group of workers was vastly impacted by containerization. We had 35,000 workers uh, here in this port at one time, now we have 3,500. 
We have uh, somewhere over 10,000 uh, pensioners and retirees that our pension plan takes care of. Pension plan, because of a number of reasons, which I can get into later, is underfunded by about three quarters of a billion dollars. So funding those obligations is, uh, is a big cost, and that's part of the legacy cost that I think Bob was talking about. Um, in terms of um, building a resolve to change what is, I think today in the face of true competition from places like Norfolk and Halifax and the South Atlantic ports, the businessmen here that have invested in the facilities and even the ILA realize that there, there is a real threat to what is here today and the jobs that are here today. So there is now a building of a resolve to change the world we live in. Uh, I think people like Jim Devine and myself and others do want to change the world we live in, but we have to do that over the bargaining table, and it's something that we've been gearing up to do, and it's something that we talked to the Waterfront Commission about and anybody else that will listen. Um, we know we have to do things differently. We know we have to improve our productivity, our efficiencies, our cost, and um, there is today, I believe, a resolve to attack those things. And Bob would like Bob, to make a comment. Bob would like to make a comment. Yeah, just, a, just to be absolutely clear, I was referring to these kinds of legacy labor agreements and not, not organized uh, cr crime, and you have to refer those questions to the U.S. Attorney, I guess, and to the Labor Commission. But, um, but I would say, and I just wanted to respond to something that was said earlier about, about the comparisons with the Port of Singapore and Rotterdam, and I think it's very important to make, to, 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 we, we don't have to have a Me Too strategy saying if somebody else is doing it, we need to do it, but, but I do think that it's a good idea to keep our eye on the competition. I will say, and I've spent time in, 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 in all of these places, and uh, one fundamental difference between New York and the U.S. on the one hand, and Western Europe and, and, and uh, much of Asia, much of you know, uh, Singapore, and, uh, and then, uh, and, and then uh, the Netherlands, uh, these places, uh, many of them have, in Singapore, stable or declining populations, stable or declining workforces. And it's a fine thing to say, well, we're going to go up, you know, up, up the value chain and so forth. I think that's, you know, and perhaps we'd be thinking about the same thing. But we happen to be living in a place that, that, is, uh, that on the other hand, is welcoming immigrants. Uh, New Yorkers and New Jerseyans are continuing to have kids in a way that their counterparts in the, in the Netherlands and, uh, uh, and, and in Singapore are not. And we're looking at a million additional New Yorkers in the city and three million additional residents of the tri-state region. Uh, 140 million additional Americans by mid-century, and so this business of creating jobs, you know, for people who don't have advanced degrees is not an incidental thing for us. It's something that we that has to be a fundamental part of any strategy, any economic development strategy, and any port development strategy. And I guess the other thing is that I know is that the notion, I, everything that's been said by Andy and others about the need, you know, we're clearly in a in a in a new world in terms of our understanding of what we need to do uh, to prepare for climate change and to avoid the worst of climate change and to prepare for things that already underway, the stuff that David Bragdon mentioned today with sea level rise and so forth. But I don't think we have to choose, you know, a smaller, uh, you know, port. Uh, again, we don't need to be, don't need to be biggest and bestest, and we don't have to be thinking about how can we jam every additional, you know, truck into the port to get another, another cargo, another con uh, a container to Chicago because LA might beat us to that. I don't think that's the game that we're in. But we do need to be in the business of making sure that we, we sustain the standard of living that most New Yorkers uh, would like to have for themselves and their kids. And, and we need to be thinking about the next generation of an even larger place that, that and, and, these are, and this is not a question of pulling up the drawbridge or anything, anything else. These are the people who are coming here because they want to be here or because they're born here. So at any rate, I think that's so, so but I think uh, I certainly don't disagree with any of the other comments that have been made this morning, except for the organized crime business. So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I, I think, uh, Manju, would you allow, have any final comments, or, or Andy, any, any no, other really. comments to make? Because we do want to wrap it up. I would, I would make that, one. That would put me in between the crowd and lunch, so no. <laughs> no, I would make one observation in terms of the future. I personally see it very bright. Um, just the fact that we're having this session here today is, is t testimony to the fact that there's a new awakening to how we look at these things. If you go back, uh, we had one of our distinguished pilots from Sandy Hook with us today, and if you went back in his records and you looked at his, uh, the, the traffic that his organization handled in 1956 prior to the advent of containerization, the Port of, Greater Port of New York handled approximately 14,500 ships in international commerce. 
And if you look at what it did, and I think it was 2008 was the last time that I actually did an inventory of what happened. And in international commerce, there was about 4,200 ships uh, in international commerce. So what has happened? There's tremendous efficiency in terms of the number of uh, uh, ships coming into the harbor, but yet they were still carrying more cargo. And that speaks well to the environment. That speaks well to the bilge water that was being washed over the side or all the other manifestations of, of, uh, of, of the vessels coming into harbor. With the advent of the Panama Canal, with the larger ships coming, uh, I, I kind of agree with Manju that we may not have an onslaught of incremental cargo coming to us from Asia, but rather we're going to have that cargo coming to us on few, fewer, more efficient ships. The responsibility of the terminal operators is to be able to accommodate that. And we're going to accommodate that with uh, greener technology, more efficient, safer operations, and dare, dare I say, less, uh, less labor costs at some point in time. That has to be addressed across the table. But the future is bright. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very pleased that, uh, that this uh, organization uh, uh, held this meeting today, and I won't keep you from lunch any longer. Do we have some yeah, comments? Just, so thank you all very much for a great panel.